Last but not least, all the way from New York, the number one Irishman in my heart, Dr. John Mulholland. He's been here many times. Come on up. Thank you, Mark. It's my pleasure to be here. I think this is maybe the uh, fifth time I've been here. I wasn't here last year. I really enjoyed T Tony Zeitman's comments, and I think that uh, you'll hear many of them echoed by me. Um, I would take, um, uh, I would disagree with one of them, and that is that survival is the only thing that matters. As a penis doctor, I have a vested interest in other things. Um, so we're going to talk about optimizing sexual function in the prostate cancer patient. What do I mean by optimizing? Optimizing doesn't mean, Mr. Jones, you'll be able to stuff your penis in your wife's vagina, Mr. Jones. Optimizing means getting you as close as we can to where you were. All right? The most penis-friendly treatment is active surveillance. Everything you will do for your prostate cancer, surgery, radiation, or hormone therapy, will have a significant negative effect on your sexual function. You just need to prepare for that. There is no way, absolutely no way around that. Sexual function outcomes isn't just hardness of your penis. Okay, there are other things that are important to men. Orgasm, libido, ejaculatory function, orgasmic pain, leaking urine during the time of orgasm. All of these things a sexual medicine doctor, me, will help take care of for you. But your oncologist is extremely unlikely ever to mention that. And the prostate cancer patient isn't just prostatectomy. It isn't just radiation patients, it isn't just hormone patients, it's men who've had double and triple therapy. And if you've had triple therapy, those of you in the room who had surgery and radiation and hormone therapy, I want you to leave here today understanding that your sex life is not over. Uh, these are my disclosures, uh, grants from Pfizer, the Center for Intimacy After Cancer Therapy. We're developing a questionnaire specifically for prostatectomy patients. We've got some NIH funding through Chris Nelson, who's a psychologist that works with me. You'll see a number of industry-sponsored um, uh, consultancies. Um, really, they're not going to interfere with my presentation today. Now, this is John Hewlings Jackson, who's a neurologist at the beginning of the 20th century. One of my favorite quotations to start one of these lectures. It takes 50 years to get a wrong idea out of medicine, and it takes 100 years to get a right idea into medicine. The wrong idea is, Mr. Jones, I've cured your prostate cancer, you should be happy. The right idea is that we're going to look after the totality of Mr. Jones, which includes his sexual and his urinary function after his surgery and after his radiation. Who am I? I'm a urologist. I'm a urologist who specializes in sexual and reproductive medicine. I'm at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. I've spent 18 years devoting myself to the care of patients with prostate cancer. About 50% of my clinical practice is prostate cancer, and probably 75% of my research is related to you guys. Why am I here? Why have I taken the weekend to travel all the way from New York to LAX Marriott? Uh, and be with you is because I believe in your plight. I believe in you, and I'll say this to you again, and if you've heard me speak at this meeting or other patient meetings, you'll hear me say the same thing over and over again. I can only do so much. You have to do a lot of the work. We are eons behind breast cancer and breast cancer advocacy, and until you stand up and start shouting and screaming, we're not going to make a huge amount of progress. Okay? Now, I have no dog in this fight. I don't do prostatectomies. I don't deliver radiation. I'm interested in the truth. The quest for truth is what I'm interested in, very much like you heard Tony Zeitman talk earlier on. So um, you'll hear this again and again. There is a, a very large initiative from the National Institutes of Health uh, on survivorship. The concept that we're not just here to cure your cancer, Mr. Jones, we're here also to treat the consequences of your diagnosis, and of your treatment, and that is survivorship. And at Memorial Sloan Kettering, I think we have now something in the range of 40 survivorship nurses across all spectrum uh, of cancer, including two in prostate, uh, prostatectomy and two, I think, in radiation oncology. So this is a huge area, and I am, in essence, a survivorship physician. This is probably the most important slide. If you've had treatment already, 
Uh, if you've completed treatment, it may be too late for you to read this slide. If you haven't had treatment or you're facing having adjuvant therapy of some kind, this is very important. Achieving optimal outcomes requires full informed consent before, before treatment, which requires that the physician or clinician gives you realistic expectations, not just about the success, but about the side effects of the treatment. You'll hear me say this on more than one occasion. You need to have your eyes wide open. Okay? You must have your eyes wide open when you're undertaking therapy. Undertaking therapy. This is the prostate cancer journey. There is no point in this spectrum, in the journey, where sexual function is not affected. We know that the diagnosis of prostate cancer alone can cause sexual problems, predominantly erectile dysfunction. A man's erectile function the day before his radical prostatectomy or before he starts radiation therapy is routinely not as good as it was six months before his diagnosis. Why? Stress, adrenaline, the world's most potent anti-erection chemical, is the stress hormone. We're anxious about something, we're worried about something, high levels of adrenaline turns off erectile function. Every woman in the audience knows what I'm going to say next. A man is only as good as his last erection. If his last erection isn't good, he walks into the bedroom the next time wondering, I hope it's going to be okay. And that causes adrenaline. And then he becomes a spectator of his own function in the bedroom. Am I hard enough? I don't think I'm hard enough. I'm getting, I'm getting soft. And that opens the floodgates. That is not a glib statement. That is physiology... 101. The only penis-friendly prostate cancer management strategy is active surveillance. Okay, I've already said this, but if you are absolutely committed to maintaining your sexual and erectile function the way it is today, the only way you can achieve that is active surveillance. Now, there are many men who've had prostatectomy and radiation who, with the use of medication, or what's commonly called in the field erectile AIDS, Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, Stendra may get back to where they were before surgery, before radiation, but they are required to use something to help them get there. What are the barriers to optimal outcomes? Clinician bias, okay? We project onto our patients. We're humans. It's human nature. Classic example of that is Cialis. Cialis is a 36-hour drug. Okay, urologists are the biggest prescribers of the 36-hour drug, particularly young urologists. Because you speak to young urologists and say, well, of course everyone's interested in Le Weekender, as it's called in Paris, right? Of course everyone is. But, you know, the 65-year-old man in front of you may not be interested in 36 hours activity, okay? But physicians project onto their patients, their past experience, their personal experiences, and some other factors lead to clinician bias, and Tony mentioned one that's very, very important, and that is this external influences, consultancies with companies, consultancies with industry, etc., etc. Eyes wide open. Patient bias. You may hate the concept that somebody's going to put a knife on your belly and make an incision or shove some metal rod with a telescope on it into your belly. You may just absolutely, under no circumstances, have interest in surgery despite the fact that it might be the right thing for you. Vice versa, you may be paranoid that you don't want your prostate left if you've got prostate cancer, you're not doing radiation. What I would encourage you to do is factor that into the decision-making process, but not have it be the only factor that you make your decision on. Healthcare environment factors. What are the facilities? There are facilities that don't have IMRT. There are facilities that don't have a robot. Knowledge factors, you and the physician. Technical expertise factors. Later on, I'm going to talk to you about physician experience and the importance of that when it comes to surgery. Technology factors, robot versus cyber knight versus proton beam therapy. Insufficient support. In my area, a physician cannot run a program that I run. It is impossible for me to do this on my own. I need a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant to help that. I have three nurse practitioners, God bless them, who run this program. In a center that doesn't have that resource, you will get suboptimal care for your sexual health after your treatment. There is no way to avoid that. 
You have to be at a center that has resources to support the quality of life issues as well as the cancer issues and financial factors I've already touched on. This is very, very important. Patients think that their treating physician will tell them all they need to hear when in fact the physician will tell you what he or she thinks you need to hear. Only you can determine what you want and need to hear. That means you need to do your homework before you go to see the doctor. And in my area, in penis medicine, you need to have a clear sense for how important your sexual health, your sexual relationship is in your life before you speak to a prostatectomist, a radiation oncologist, or a medical oncologist. Realistic expectations, referral pre-therapy to a sexual medicine clinician. I think Tony alluded to the concept that they don't do that very well. Rat onks don't do this very well. I agree. I would say prostatectomists don't do it very well. In fact, we've got to an alarming state in American medicine, American urology, where prostatectomists are becoming technicians. You walk in to see them, you see them once, they have your pathology review, they talked about your PSA, your MRI, you're booked for surgery, and you never see the prostatectomist again. They are gone. They are a ghost. Okay? To me, that is wrong. But to keep their numbers up, they have to keep seeing new patients, and they have to keep doing operations, because not just funding a proton beam, funding a robot is really challenging for a hospital. And they have to crank out cases. And I think that is, frankly, despicable. Discussion of prevalence of major sexual problems, that's what you need to have before you go in. You need to know what you're getting into, have an idea, what are the sexual side effects of the treatment. Discussion of chronology, time course of recovery. Discussion of strategies to minimize long-term effects. We do not have time at this sitting to talk about rehabilitation, but when I go across to the next session, and by the way, after the um, exhibit hall, for those of you who are still interested in talking to me, we're going to go to another room and have further talk, and we'll talk about rehabilitation. And then finally, discussions of strategies about treating the adverse events, not preventing them, but also treating them. Barriers to good sexual health care, physician discomfort. Physicians get two hours of sexual health education in medical school, right? How can they be comfortable talking to you about your penis and your ejaculation if they just never practiced it? You think that urologists learn this in residency, I will tell you, it is number zero on the list. It is way down the list of things that they learn. They love to learn how to do cystectomies and prostatectomies and treat kidney stones and treat uh, prostate uh, disease with lasers. But if you take the average urology resident at the end of his residency and put him in a room and say, I want you to take a sexual history of Mr. Jones, duh, okay, they will struggle because they don't do ambulatory care. And I would say, frankly, I think we're miseducating our residents because they can't take basic histories in areas that are not primo in urology training. Patient embarrassment. Okay. Time constraints, this is a real issue in 21st century healthcare. There's a limited amount of time that we have to speak to patients. However, what I say to patients is I'm going to answer everything I possibly can in the next 20 minutes for you. And if we don't answer everything, we'll get you back and we'll keep talking until everything is answered. And that is what you need to do. You need to understand how to navigate healthcare. You bring in your list. We always roll our eyes. They take out the legal notepad. There's four pages of questions, right? But that's what you should do. Okay, and if you don't get it all answered, you go back on another occasion and do that. Physician projection and concept of physician as a technician. We've talked about ageism. He's 72 years of age. He's had a good innings. Okay, his sexual function isn't, isn't that important. I have two 93-year-old men in my practice. One is a 91-year-old wife. The other is an 85-year-old girlfriend. They're using penile injection therapy. They're having sex at least weekly. Okay, I don't care how old you are. I do care what your motivation is to have sexual relations. And sexual relations, by the way, isn't just intercourse, it also includes outer course. You define for me what is satisfactory sex for you. I don't define that. You tell me what your goal and your target is. The patient with baseline ED, this is a very, very concerning issue. If you go in before treatment and you already have erection problems, yeah, doc, I use some Viagra and Cialis every so often, that physician, surgery or radiation, will look at you differently. He already has ED. We're not going to make big efforts to save his nerves or limit the effects on his nerves, radiation. You need to communicate 
to the physician, while I'm using Viagra, my sex life is really important, doctor. Let us do whatever we can to preserve it. Single patient and the gay patient. There is terrible sexual health care for gay men and lesbians in the United States of America. The amount of literature on this is, is just embarrassingly small. Very little attention for this population. So, erectile function preservation. One of the predictors, baseline function, the better you are before surgery, before radiation, the better you'll be, and the younger you are, the better. The two most important factors are age and your baseline function. If you walk in and you're 75 versus 45, or your erections aren't very good and you're doing okay with Viagra but not great, your functional recovery will be worse. You have to understand that. That does not mean you will not have sexual relations again. It will mean, however, you will be using higher order erectile aids. For surgery, the degree of nerve sparing. Patients come see me all the time and they say, but my surgeon says my nerves were saved. Why do I have problems? The maneuvers surgeons use to protect those nerves put them to sleep for 9 to 12 months, and it takes them another 9 to 12 months to wake up fully. That's why maximum recovery after surgery is 18 to 24 months, not 6 months. Don't ever let anyone tell you. Don't ever let a famous robot surgeon tell you, you'll be fine after 6 months. It is extremely unlikely that will ever be. If you're 40 years of age, perfect erection is a perfect nerve spurring, maybe. But for the average prostate cancer patient having a prostatectomy, that is unrealistic expectations. Why is that a travesty? When a patient is told, you'll be fine at six months, by month seven, when he's not, sense of hopelessness sets in and they start giving up on everything. I knew this was going to be a disaster. And they throw in the towel. And they throw in the towel on treatment, and they avoid. They become avoidant. And the wives say to me, not alone do we not have sex anymore, doctor, but all those little things that we used to do, spooning in bed, cuddling on the couch, holding my hands when we walk to the movies, doctor, it's gone. And that is human nature. That is the white chromosome at its worst. Physician experience. We have data now to show that the surgeon volume and the number of prostatectomies done by the surgeon is critically important to your outcomes. Don't be afraid to ask that question. Men are terrible at doing this. Women are much better. Doctor, how many of these have you done? How many of these do you do every month? Okay, important questions. We have no data for radiation oncologists. It would be shocking to me if that concept was not true for radiation also. Medical conditions, those conditions that cause erection problems, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, coronary artery disease, cigarette smoking, all are going to lead to worse outcomes, even if you don't have problems at baseline. They will, after surgery, after radiation, lead to problems. Uh, this is a, um, a table just running down the impact of treatments on various aspects of function. Erectile dysfunction, painful ejaculation, blood and semen, urine leakage, orgasm, blah, 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 blah. The bottom line is every treatment you can possibly get, surgery, whatever variety, radiation, whatever variety, hormone therapy, will have a negative impact on your sexual health. Radical prostatectomy, immediate effect. Tuesday night, I had sex with my wife. Wednesday, I had a prostatectomy. Thursday, and for the next 9 to 12 months, I had absolutely no erections, doctor. That is routine. 85% of men, within the first six months after surgery, no function on their own, and do very poorly with PD-5 inhibitors, Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, and Stendra. Expect that. That is routine. The low point, the nadir in erectile function is actually three months. So many, very often patients will say, I had a great erection the week after the catheter came out. That implies good nerve sparing, but the swelling and scarring around the nerves over the ensuing two, three months caused the nerves to stop functioning. Low point, three to four months after surgery. Recovery, 18 to 24 months. I put these up to give you realistic expectations because I think the vast majority of prostatectomists don't have this conversation with you. Back to baseline, BTB. You'll never see this in the literature. You'll never hear anyone talk about it. But when the doctor comes out, the surgeon comes out after surgery and says to your wife, everything went great. Usually what patients think is, I'll be fully caught and my PSA will never be detectable and my erections will be just fine. I'll be back to where I was. 20% of men ever get back to baseline. 
Whatever your hardness was, whatever your ability was before surgery, 20% of men get back to baseline. If you're over 60 years of age at Memorial Sloan Kettering, Paragon of prostatectomy surgeon. We have surgeons, all they do for a living for the last 25 years is take out prostates, so they know what they're doing. That figure, back to baseline, is about 5%. 5% of men over 60 years of age ever get back to their baseline function. Recovery, baseline age, function, nurse bearing are important. I'm not going to talk about rehab, but I'm going to make sure we talk about it when we go over across uh, in the exhi exhibition hall. Ejaculation. 40% of patients in my practice walk in never understanding after prostatectomy they will never ejaculate again. Okay? You can't ejaculate. The prostate's removed, the seminal vesicles, and you have a radical vasectomy behind your prostate. No semen. You may have clear sticky fluid come out of the tip of your penis. What on the street is called pre-cum. That is just secretions from your glands and your urethra. Okay? That is not semen. There's no sperm in that. You cannot get anyone pregnant. So, what happens if you're not finished having a family? Now, the problem is that most prostatectomists are going to look at you at 62 years of age and say, 62 years of age, we're not going to worry about that. But maybe they don't know that you've got a 35-year-old wife and maybe you're not finished having a family. That's Manhattan. That's very common in Manhattan. So these men bank sperm, <laughs> right? Bank sperm. We can get sperm from your testicle after surgery. We're doing one of those in the next couple of weeks. But really, the ideal way to do this is if you're not finished having a family, bank sperm. If you're going to get radiation to your prostate and you're still interested in start having a family, you cannot start a family for 12 months after radiation. 12 months after chemo, 12 months after radiation, no unprotected intercourse because of DNA damage in sperm. Okay? The problem is that after radiation, you're likely to be, get to the point where you won't ejaculate also. Um, even though you won't ejaculate, you should have an orgasm. Many men don't understand that. You don't need an erection for an orgasm. They walk in after surgery and say, my penis is completely soft and I had an orgasm. And 10% of our men will say their orgasms are better after a prostatectomy. No idea why that is, but it's absolutely routine in our practice. About 10% of men say that. Pain is uncommon, but it's a well-established entity after surgery and radiation. About 15% of men will have orgasmic pain. It usually goes away. And... Um, usually responds to drugs like Uroxetron and Flomax if it's really bothersome. Sexual incontinence is a relatively new term. And uh, really, if you go back probably more than five or six years ago, and very little in the literature on this, men leaking urine at the time of orgasm. Every time I have an orgasm, doctor, I'm ejaculating urine. My wife is appalled, okay? So a man may have a good erection, no problem. I take a Viagra, I'm hard but he may have unsatisfactory sexual relations because every time he has an orgasm, he's leaking urine all over his wife. And sometimes that's an ounce or two or three ounces, would you believe? Yes, we want you to empty your bladder, but in the 15, 20 minutes between you emptying your bladder and, and having an orgasm, your bladder may have filled again. Okay, sexual incontinence is called climacteria. Urine's not toxic, not associated with UTIs in women, it's not associated with yeast infections, but aesthetically for many couples, it's a problem. Now, a new concept is called arousal incontinence. Doctor, I go to hug my wife, I start getting uh, a slight tumescence of my penis, and, and I start dripping urine from my penis. Even though this has less urine involved, because of its unpredictability, it causes much greater distress than orgasm-associated incontinence, arousal incontinence. And there are strategies, and we can talk about that later on, if you wish. 70% of men in the literature after prostatectomy have documented penile length loss. It is not related to my surgeon said my prostate was that long and therefore my penis is going to be that much shorter. We pull the bladder down, we don't pull the penis in. Early on, this is a temporary phenomenon. It's due to actually a hypercontractility of the smooth muscle so the penis becomes kind of shrunken. If I examine you and I grab your penis and put it on stretch, it'll stretch normally. So that's a temporary phenomenon. But really after six months, if it's still there, that's because of muscle degeneration. Mr. Jones, your penis is like your biceps. If you take your arm and you put it into a plaster cast for a year, what happens to your uh, biceps, Mr. Jones? It undergoes atrophy, Dr. Mulhall. Exactly. The same thing happens in your penis, except in your penis, that's permanent. All right? So rehabilitation, which we'll talk about later, is about preventing that atrophy. That's why if you're going to do something to protect your penis after surgery radiation, you really need to think about doing it soon, not later on. Uh, after treatment. What about radiation? Interestingly, with radiation, there's very little effect 
on your erectile function in the first 12 months. For men with good function going into radiation, they'll come in at 12 months and say, you know, this is great, there's been no change. The bad news is that the low point after radiation is three to five years after the completion of radiation. So it will drop. Sometimes it drops dramatically, sometimes it drops very slightly, depending on baseline function, patient age, and dose of radiation. If you have androgen deprivation therapy, certainly if you, is Tony gone? I think Tony's gone. Certainly if you have more than four months of radiation, that is not going to be good for your erectile function. It will worsen your outcomes. Radiation alone will be better than radiation with hormone therapy if you get more than four months, four to six months of androgen deprivation therapy. Now what's interesting, I get many men come to see me and they say, I haven't decided if I'm going to have radiation or surgery. What should I do? I always start the conversation the same way. I'm a penis doctor. I'm not a prostate cancer specialist. And the ED rates after surgery and radiation, three years after treatment, are about the same. The next thing I say is, that's based on me as an expert looking at papers on radiation over here from experts like Tony Zeitman and looking at papers over here on prostatectomy from expert centers. There's no randomized controlled trial. There's no 500 men got radiation, 500 men got surgery, and here are the outcomes. That's never been done and never will be done. So it's me using, looking at data and basically making extrapolation. Okay? But the bottom line is never choose your treatment based on your future erectile function. What we do in every one of those men, if any of you are in the situation now, is we measure your testosterone level. And if your testosterone level is low at baseline, at Memorial, and I think at most places in the country, you'll have to wait 12 weeks after surgery to go on testosterone, and I'm happy to talk about that later, and you'll have to wait three years after radiation. So if your testosterone level is low, we may say to you, your testosterone level is really low, it puts you at risk for diabetes, it puts you at risk for cardiovascular disease, and it puts you at risk for osteoporosis. We think you should be treated, and we think you need to give greater consideration to surgery rather than radiation. What about ejaculation? Here are the figures. This is Memorial Sloan Kettering data. 70% of men at three years after radiation, 90% at five years, no semen. Just like a prostatectomy. Their prostate's there, but it's scarred down because of the radiation. The ejaculation ducts are scarred. There's no semen. Be prepared. No semen, but orgasm, just as the prostatectomy patients. There's very little data on orgasm, and there's no data on penile length or sexual incontinence after radiation. The radiation group are really probably one and a half decades behind the prostatectomy group in really delineating the sexual function consequences of, um, of radiation. Androgen deprivation therapy, going on Lupron, the Garolex, whatever drug, there's like so many of them I can barely keep up nowadays, causes erection tissue degeneration. If you're on it for longer than six months, it's a problem. We don't need a lot of testosterone to keep our erection tissue healthy, but we need some. And when you've none, that's a problem. You will get erectile tissue degeneration and you will get a concept called venous leak. Venous leak is the concept that your penis is like a tire. Two hoses bringing in blood, there's a valve that closes. When we get a hard erection, that's because the valve is closed and blood is trapped in there. When you get erection tissue degeneration from nerve injury at the time of surgery, hormone therapy, or high doses of radiation, that muscle can't control the valve and blood flows in and flows back out. Flows in and flows back out. And classic features are men don't get hard, they can't sustain an erection, the better erections are better standing than when they lie, etc., etc. Hormone therapy routinely leads to failure to respond to Viagra, Levitra, or Cialis. If you're on hormone therapy at that time, when you've no testosterone, you will not have a response to PD-5 inhibitors, almost certainly, and it will be extremely unlikely you'll have any libido, and extremely unlikely that you will have an orgasm. You need testosterone for libido, and you need testosterone for uh, orgasm. You also need testosterone to make semen. So even if you haven't had a prostatectomy or haven't had radiation, you're just on hormone therapy, almost certainly you'll have no semen. So we've talked about this before, degree of nerve sparing, preoperative erectile function, patient age, physician experience, physician volume, and vascular comorbidities. I'm going to finish up by giving you 20 tips from Mulhall, okay? Uh, take it or leave it, but these are things that I've kind of learned over the course of the last 18 years. There's a tremendous panic when people get diagnosed with prostate cancer. For the vast majority of prostate cancer patients, you're going to have a Gleason 7 or a Gleason 3, or a Gleason 6, 3 plus 3, and the vast majority of patients are going to have organ-confined cancer. 
and you don't need to rush along. And people often, and I see this all the time in my practice, often make bad decisions because the panic button is pushed. Take your time. You have at least, at least a month and probably three months if you have uh, low to intermediate grade prostate cancer that's organ confined. Okay? Do not panic. Inform yourself. Get information. Increasingly, there is a lot of emphasis on active surveillance. You know, uh, I did my residency in the mid-90s, and uh, we were doing lots of prostatectomies in patients with Gleason 6 organ-confined cancer. Peter Scardino, who is one of the world's most famous uh, prostatectomists, is the chairman of surgery at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and stands up in public and says he's never seen a patient with pathologically proven Gleason 6. So the prostate's removed, they look at it, all that's in there is Gleason 6. He's never seen a patient die of prostate cancer under those circumstances. All right? So why are we taking out the prostate in Gleason 6? Because we don't know that there isn't Gleason 7 or Gleason 8 in the middle of the prostate. That's why we need better markers. But I would love you, if you haven't had any treatment yet, to ask the question, why am I not a candidate for active surveillance? It may well be you've got a high volume Gleason 6 or you've got a Gleason 7 or a Gleason 8 or your PSA is too high. But ask the question at least. I think, as I've said before, you need to think about what you want your future sex life to be. You can't do that on your own if you're in a relationship. You need to talk to your partner. Now, for those of you who are married 35 years, it might be 34 and a half years since you've talked about sex. You've just had it. Okay? So having what we call the conversation is really important. Okay? Okay, I don't think it should be done when you're doing the dishes together or out having dinner. Set aside some time. Have a conversation and talk about what's the vision for our future sex life. How important is intercourse? How satisfying is outer course for us? Go in to the physician's office to have the discussion about your treatment, understanding what you want from your sex life. Sometimes what the man and what the woman wants or what the man and what the partner wants are very different. And we can help with that. We have psychologists who help with that discussion. But that's really important in my specialty. I've said this to you before, have your eyes wide open, okay? Go ask questions. Don't be afraid. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be worried about making the doctor feel uncomfortable. If the doctor is uncomfortable with you asking what are reasonable questions, that doctor is not the doctor for you, okay? Any doctor who is defensive is defensive for a reason, okay? And I think you need to look elsewhere. Understand what the treating physician means by erectile function recovery. Oh, 90% of my patients have erection function recovery. Okay, first of all, 90% defies the laws of physics and physiology. Impossible. Okay, do not, do not believe any prostatectomist, any radiation oncologist who says that 90% of the patients have excellent erections after their treatment. It is impossible. It is possible if they're using penis injections. It's possible if they've had perfect erections before surgery, perfect nurse bearing, and they're using a pill after surgery. But understand what they mean. And I would encourage you to seriously think about saying, what do you mean by erection function recovery? Is that patients using pills or injections? Okay. I think if you're having a prostatectomy, or if you're having radiation therapy, and your function is good before surgery, and you're 65 years of age or younger, Okay, at two years to three years after treatment, it's reasonable to think that 50% of men will be functional without the use of any medication. If you're older, if you're poorer function, if you're using medication before, then those figures are going to be lower. Our prostatectomy patients who come in who are under 65, good function, do rehab, good nurse bearing, 80% of them are responding to Viagra Levitra cells at two years after surgery. Okay? They're using something. They were not using something before. It's different, but they are functional. I would encourage you to not rely on a single source when deciding on a treating physician. You spend more time trying to decide on who your plumber is than who your prostatectomist or your rat onc is. You go to your family doctor and your family doctor says, go see Bill Jones down the street. He's a, he's a great guy. He's a good surgeon. Dr. Smith, the primary care physician, has probably never been in the operating room with Dr. Jones. Doesn't know that Dr. Jones throws instruments and loses his head and is really not a very good prostatectomist. Right? You can't rely on your primary care physician. You can get feedback from your primary care physician about how other patients have been handled. But there are other things that you need to do, okay? Word of mouth is critically important. Understand in prostatectomy and radiation oncology that even the best surgeons 
are going to have patients who don't do very well because of anatomical reasons or things that happen during the operation. Okay? It's just no surgeon has perfect outcomes all the time and likewise for a radiation oncologist. Get realistic expectations about time frame. We talked about the six months versus 18 to 24 months. With radiation therapy, again, you're not out of the woods until you're at least three years out. Okay? You won't know what your long-term function is going to be until you're at least three years after, after your treatment. Open versus robotic. There is no evidence that robotic prostatectomy is any better from an erectile function recovery, urinary function recovery, or prostate cancer treatment. No evidence. Now, if there was a Nobel Prize for marketing, it would go to intuitive surgical. You heard Tony Zeitman talk about this already. 2003, 5% of prostatectomies were done using a robot. Last year, it was 90%. This is the amount of evidence that shows it's superior. It's about $4,000 more expensive than an open procedure. Can a robot take a mediocre surgeon and make him or her a little better? I think it can. I think it absolutely can. But you should always choose your surgeon and not the approach they use. There are surgeons who do fantastic open procedures who I would say to them, never change. Why would you change? Peter Scardino, still does open surgery. Superb, superb outcomes. Do not get the wall pulled over your eyes. Very much like that diagram that you saw earlier on from Tony Zeitman about the explosion in um, proton beam therapy centers. It's become a marketing strategy. It's becoming a, um, I think he used uh, the word a war, a battle. Okay? That is absolutely the case. There is an economic reason why this is happening. It does not necessarily translate into better, bad outcomes. Physician experience is the key to success. Okay? Here's data. This is really one of the few data slides I have. This is from James Easton and Andrew Vickers at Memorial Sloan Kettering. On the bottom line, surgeon experience, the number of surgeries they've done in their life okay, as a surgeon. On the uh, y-axis there is five-year probability of PSA being undetectable. And you can see that about 250 prostatectomies, they start getting really, really good. It improves a little bit beyond that. Now, as somebody who trains surgeons, I know that number isn't always 250. It might be 150 for a really talented, very, very good surgeon, but it might be 400 for another surgeon. Okay? So there's an experience factor here. This is not to give the chap who's just leaving residency or fellowship and is doing his third prostatectomy a hard time, but there is a reality. This is from Memorial Stone Kettering. We've published this. This is probability of continence at 12 months on the x-axis, probability of uh, good function, erectile function at 12 months. The bigger the circle, the greater the lifetime experience of the surgeon. Each circle is one surgeon, right? So you'd imagine the big circle should be all the way up top right-hand corner, and the little circle should be all the way down the bottom. And what you see is what's called heterogeneity in surgeon outcomes that their surgeons, the top right, who have very small circles, they're just starting. Why? They're good. They are just good. And then there are surgeons with lots of experience down the end who aren't that good. And patients say to me all the time, how should I pick a surgeon? I can't help you with that. What I can tell you is that what we need as a surgeon during a prostatectomy is patience. We need to be patient. We don't need to be rushing off to our next golf game, or we don't need to be doing five prostatectomies in a day, and come on, come on, we've got to get going. That's not the way it's supposed to work. You're supposed to take your time, okay? And that's how the best outcomes occur. IMRT versus C versus Cyberknife versus Proton Beam. You heard Tony Zeitman talk really with regard to prostate cancer outcomes, PSA outcomes, no real difference. I can tell you definitively there is no data that one form of radiation is better than another. I can tell you, all forms of radiation are worse if you have androgen deprivation therapy in conjunction with them. So when patients come in and say, should I have surgery, should I have radiation? And I say, it's about the same three years out after treatment. The exclusion is if you have hormone therapy, because that will be worse than radical prostatectomy. Okay? So there is no data on erectile function recovery in this regard. Okay? And to be honest with you, I don't think we'll ever see a difference between these because they all get radiation to the prostate and one centimeter around the prostate. The nerves are there, the arteries are there. 40% of radiation goes to the penis. You're getting a prostate radiated, 40% or so goes to your penis. It's inescapable. Your penis is one to one and a half centimeters below your prostate. Impossible to miss it. 
What does nurse bearing really mean? Nurse bearing is not all or none. It's not yes, it was served, no, it was, it was not saved. It is incremental. Yes, you know, I took a little bit of the nerves. They're grading systems. So I think it's very important if you're having a prostatectomy to say to your surgeon, what was my nurse bearing? Oh, that looks pretty good. Right? That's not what you want. What was the left nerve like? What was the right nerve like? You know, where, do, do you think you saved? What percentage do you think you saved? Now, understand that's a little bit of a guess, particularly in an inexperienced surgeon's hands. In a very experienced surgeon's hands, they really know. Were they close to those nerves or were they far away? Did they have to trim some of those nerves? The more nerve tissue saved, the better for you. Why? Nerve tissue resection, damage to those nerves, leads to reflex degeneration in the erection tissue. The worse those nerves are saved, the worse that scarring of the erection tissue is that atrophy phenomenon. ADT is the most penis-threatening thing you can possibly have, okay? Inescapable. No way around that. Irrefutable. Nobody's going to be able to stand up here with me and argue with that. It's the most penis-threatening thing you have. So if somebody says to you, I think you need to have uh, Lupron or the Garlex or whatever, your next question should be, what's the survival benefit of that? And only you can answer the question, is that survival benefit worth the damage that's going to occur to my sexual function? The vast majority of people say, yeah, I'll take a day. But there are people who will say, you know, if the survival benefit's six months or a year, and it's going to cause this to what is an amazing sex life with my young wife, I'm not going to do that. That is your decision. And just as surgeons don't give you realistic expectations, just as radiation oncologists, most of them, don't give you realistic expectations, I'll tell you medical oncologists dole out androgen deprivation therapy like it's water without having the conversation with you. The diabetes conversation, the osteoporosis conversation, and the sexual dysfunction conversation. Ask about penile rehab. We'll talk about that over in the exhibition hall. Get clear instructions on how to use erection pills. It's not good enough somebody just to give you a sample pack of Cialis and say, okay, right? there are instructions, all right? For Viagra and Levitra, take it two hours before a meal. It lasts eight hours. Dinner at 7, you take it at 5, you're good till midnight, Mr. Jones. Sexual stimulation required here and here. Can't go in the corner, read the New York Times, and all of a sudden, nothing's happening, doctor. You need sexual stimulation. Cialis, 4 to 36 hour drug. Takes 4 hours to kick in. Don't worry about food or alcohol. Lasts 36 hours. Sexual stimulation required again. Stendra, the new kid on the block, kicks in within 20 minutes. Good for 6 hours. Don't worry about food or alcohol. There are the four PD-5 inhibitors that are available in the United States of America. One-third of men have no coverage, one-third of men have coverage, one-third have some coverage, and they're paying for most of it. $30 a pill. Unbelievable. $30 a pill for this. However, if you're doing rehab after prostatectomy, for example, it'll cost you about $2,500 for the first two years. And if you're 50 years of age, and let's say you've got 25 years of sex ahead of you, that's about $100 per future year of your sex life. You have to really, honestly, without being glib, think of it in that, in that way. If sex is an important part of your life, there is an investment, time, energy, and finance that you will need to make up front to maximize and optimize your recovery. Penile injection therapy sounds awful. Oh my God. Pe the biggest problem with penis injections is the word penis and the word injection appears in the same sentence. Right? <laughs> I'll tell you a story, 10 seconds. I had a conversation with a patient in my practice a few years ago. This is true, 45 years of age, prostatectomy patient, very sad story. Talk about injections, he passes out in the chair. Okay? So, it is a mosquito bite. 92% of our prostatectomy patients get an erection good enough for intercourse in, the five, in five to 10 minutes. It's lasting 30 to 60 minutes. Best drug treatment we have. Biggest problem, mental imagery. We can get you over that. Don't turn your back on injections if it's something that you really need to consider. Beware physicians citing incredible figures for erectile function preservation. I think I've alluded to that already. 95% uh, just don't exist. If you had ED before treatment and sexual intercourse is important, it's essential you communicate. Baseline ED sets a different mindset for the treating physician, surgeon, or radiation oncologist. Declare if your erectile function is important. Triple therapy does not mean your sex life is over. Surgery, radiation, hormone therapy, radiation, surgery, hormone therapy, your sex life is not over. Somebody in my specialty should be able to help the vast majority of you. Words of advice to the partner. This is the second last slide, Mark. Don't worry. Words of advice to the partner. Dead serious. Avoid emasculation. 
I said that men are only as good as their last erection. I wasn't kidding you. The last thing they need is pressure. You need to be supportive. Okay? There's lots of things that you can teach this man. Some of the men who come to see me who've had erectile dysfunction for 10 years, the wives will sit beside him. You know what? The last 10 years, he's been a better lover than he was for the first 20 years. Because the focus is on outer course and intimacy. And it's not this American concept of have a penis, where am I going to put it concept. <laughs> right? So do not emasculate. Be supportive. Drive your partner into the office to see somebody like me if this is a problem. There are specialists like me all around the country, Sexual Medicine Society of North America. There are 400 of us or so in the country, and we are delighted to take care of you. Finally, let us not focus on adding years to life, but let's also pay attention to adding life to years. That's my job. That's what I do for a living. It's my pleasure to be here. We're going to go across in a few minutes after Mark has tortured me. Thank you very much. <laughs> I can't, I can't torture you. I only get five minutes with you. Do you remember what I gave you as a gift last time you were here? You needed batteries? Damn! Sure. You don't remember my gift. I gave you Superman boxer shorts. Okay. I just wondered if that had any meaning. I guess not. All right. No. Uh, bring up, you have this title slide. Um, uh, true or false, because you were, you were involved in the early Viagra trials. True or false that this next picture was an ad that did not make it. Um, and I, again, I don't know what they're doing in that picture of me, but they had that did not make it. So I just wanted you to see that. Maybe you hadn't seen that one before. This is the man I've seen them all, Mark. Yeah, I've I know. That's all. the problem. He's heard every I've Viagra joke. He's seen every picture. I always try to stump him. Even I say, new side effect with Viagra. If you don't swallow the pill quickly, you'll get a stiff neck. He heard that one. <laughs> Uh, it is amazing slide. what they can do with papier-mâché, though, I'll tell you. <laughs> next slide. I find it interesting that Viagra says it's not for newborns. That's actually, that's true, right? That's on the label. Um, well, you know, it's interesting because, you know, Viagra, sildenafil, is used for pulmonary hypertension. Exactly. So Revadio, which has exactly. now gone generic, sildenafil generic, is approved for newborns. Okay, but Viagra is not approved for newborns. By the way, um, Viagra is generic in the UK. There is no generic Viagra from Canada. When will it okay. be generic in the United States? Uh, 2019 is the loss of exclusivity, okay? So if you're going to, oh, I go to a Canadian pharmacy, it's from India or China, you've no idea what you're getting. But there is true generic Viagra, $4 a pill in the UK, if you can try to get it uh, to a pharmacy from there, okay? Next slide. Uh, look, I, I don't like to float anyone's book. <laughs> Best book on the subject I've seen. Uh, it's been out there for a while. Been out there since 2008. Uh, the second edition is being written. It's being written for the last year. Uh, a lot of stuff going on in my life. But we we'll get to a second edition. For those of you who haven't had treatment yet, uh, nine dollars the Kindle version um, covers everything we talked about today it does. and more. It's, I had to review it. I read it. it it's, it's actually outstanding. It covers. Uh, all, everything that any man has dealt with prostate cancer has to ask their physician and talk about before and after. So that's why I wanted to put that there. Next slide. This was the cover of Time Magazine a few weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. Can a man with prostate cancer get testosterone therapy if, it's too if his testosterone's low? Do you advocate yes. this? Tell me where you are on, on, on so, getting testosterone after yeah. being treated for prostate cancer. Testosterone is not prescribed for men with sex problems. It's not a good erection hormone. Yeah, maybe it improves your libido. But really, it's prescribed for three reasons. Low testosterone, normal range is 300 to 800, let's say levels 200 and below, are put you at risk for diabetes development. If you have diabetes, it worsens your sugar control. Puts you at risk for osteoporosis and puts you at risk for premature cardiovascular events, heart attack and stroke. Irrefutable evidence on those. So much of what we do with testosterone is to prevent those. Here's the problem. There are tons of men in America who are on testosterone who shouldn't be on testosterone. 20% of testosterone-treated patients have never had a testosterone level checked. Okay? And then there are men who need testosterone who, because of physician fear, are not put on it. The answer to your question is not straightforward. Yes, we give men who've had prostatectomy, prostate radiation for cancer, who are on active surveillance testosterone, and I can talk more about that over there. It's a discussion that needs to be held with the patient, and the bottom line is testosterone supplementation is a negotiated decision, patient and physician together. Take me through, uh, I know you only have about 30 seconds, take me through penile rehabilitation that you would advocate for 
Uh, does it start before surgery? I mean, how does this, just give me a quick look at yep. a guy's about to go into surgery. Let's say they've already had surgery or radiation. What's the kind of penile rehabilitation you're talking about after treatment? How does this look? Yeah, so I mean, listen, it's impossible to give the answer to that in 30 seconds. But um, the bottom line is what we're trying to do is we're trying to protect two tissues in the penis. There's a muscle, kind of like your bowel and your bladder muscle, but we say it's like your biceps. And we're trying to protect a tissue called the endothelium. The endothelium is the lining of our blood vessels. Our arm blood vessels, our heart blood vessels, our penis is a big blood vessel. So PD5 inhibitors, Viagra levetra cialis, even if they don't give you an erection, protect the endothelium. Irrefutable human evidence to support that. So regular use of PD5 inhibitors at low dose is of some value. What is really of value, what is the major factor in rehabilitation is getting erections. I don't care if you have intercourse, Mr. Jones. I don't care if you have an orgasm. I care that you're getting erections. Remember, every man gets three to six erections every night of his life since he went through puberty. So a guy sees me one month after surgery, it's the first time he went a day without an erection. Never mind a month. And that muscle, when it's not used, undergoes atrophy. And the atrophy really isn't atrophy. It's scarring that is irreversible. So for men who are not getting a good erection with pills early after surgery, as early as six weeks, they go straight to injection therapy as a temporary measure until the nerves wake up. And so most rehab programs revolve around regular use of pills and the use of injection therapy. Some programs use And, then, and the injection therapy is a lot better than the vacuum erection device? Yeah, because it oxygenates. It's fresh blood coming in. The problem with the, those of you who've used a vacuum device, you know this. The penis doesn't look normal. It doesn't feel normal. It's venous blood brought back in. No oxygen. So that, it, works that way, it works a lot better. And I know you say injections are like a mosquito bite, but I've yep. never had a mosquito bite me in the penis. <laughs> so how, how do I... Well, given your propensity for nudity, I'm very surprised, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Only you know that. Only he would know that. <laughs> Only he would know that with my wife. Listen, here, right. no, no, I'm serious. Let, let, no, I'm serious. Here's what that, I say. That's, that's like You're going to cut me off, so I'm going to give the answer. Stop talking. I'm going to give the answer. Here's the, here's, here's the bottom line. You don't know what it feels like until you've tried it. You sit in the chair. You're like, oh, my God, I can't do that. That's mental imagery at play. Come in, try an injection. If you say to me that day, I know I can't do this, then it's an informed decision. I will tell you over 18 years, the proportion of men who come in, I'm not sure if we're going to do this, they try it and say, no, I'm not going to do it, is really small. It is nothing like you think it is. How many times, I mean, so in penile rehab, am I getting these injections? Am I doing them daily? Am I doing them no, once doing a month? Twice a week. Twice a week. Yeah, we want to get an erection twice a week. You get 21 erections, at least 21 erections every, every week of your life when you're a younger man. As we're older, they're not, you know, the 18-year-old spends most of his night erect. Right? He's getting six erections. That's true. 45 minute erections, six of them a night. Most of the nights basically erect. For the 75 year old man, they're not fully rigid. They're not 45 minutes long, but you're getting them. Okay? That's why sleep apnea syndrome causes erection problems because you're not getting REM sleep and you're not getting nocturnal erections. How many erections a month am I supposed to be getting? <laughs> How many? I'm just, I thought you said 20 something. Yeah, 21 a week. Yeah. Oh, okay. 21, 21. Okay. So 211, that's fine, right? Yeah, all right, yeah all right. that's in the range, yeah. All right. So, um, female sexual dysfunction. Why don't we have a single thing approved for females except now they can take a pill to make it not hurt as much during sex? I, I don't understand. This is how far we've gotten with female sexual dysfunction. When's something going to come out? Um, that's, a, that's a very difficult question to answer. Um, so no, there are no, these are easy. You're the expert. Yeah. When's uh, something going to come out? Well, I mean, listen, there are medical and there are political issues probably at play. Um, the problem with female sexual dysfunction is that it's not, a, it's not hard penis, soft penis. There are lots of women, 60% of women have more than a sexual problem. Libido problems, uh, orgasm problems, clitoral engorgement problems, sexual pain problems. There's a lot of multiple factors going on. The tools, the questionnaires, for example, that we use to survey male sexual health are not as well developed for females. The endpoints are very difficult to measure. For example, in the, uh, the, um, the Sprout study with flamanserin, it's the, number, the increase in the number of sexually satisfying events. All right? It's not like, was your penis hard enough for intercourse or was it not? Okay? There are softer endpoints. It's much more difficult to measure. Okay? There's a huge movement afoot now on social media to make sure the FDA stand up and start approving 60 sexual health products approved for men, none for women. Okay? I believe that in the next three years, we will have a product for women. 
How about estrogen, just estrogen therapy, top, you know, vaginal estrogen? Yeah, estrogen is really important for your, for your vulva, vulval health. I mean, there are therapies that you can apply to your vulva, Vagifem, for example, which practically none of it gets absorbed. And our breast cancer physicians are using it at Memorial in breast cancer patients. Practically none of it gets absorbed, but without estrogen, you get atrophic vaginitis, which means those tissues become stiffer and causes pain and bleeding during sexual intercourse. Next slide. Can you bring up my next slide? I got to, I got to receive a couple pieces of mail after the last conference. Uh, this is for venous leak. So yeah. when someone has venous leak, which is a big problem, yeah. they go to a place and they say this works. They go buy these It doesn't things. work. Uh, uh, constriction bands are water. Wait, 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 wait. These don't work at all? No. They work for men who don't need it. Okay? They work as a placebo. Because the venous outflow from the penis, most of it is internally. You cannot put out that on tight enough, you know, without causing excruciating pain to control all the venous outflow. But for guys who, I'm losing my erection a little bit, they put this on, there's a 30% placebo response rate in ED, right? You give them a sugar pill, oh, I'm better. Put this on, they feel better. But for men with real venous leak, it's injection therapy or penile implant surgery. They're the only things that really work, unfortunately. And, and is it really true, as, as crazy as this sounds, if you lie on your back with an erection and you can't hold the erection, then you might have venous leak. Yeah. So, uh, so if, if your it, erections are better standing or kneeling compared to lying, then that makes us concerned that you may have venous leak. Okay. But remember, if you're lying on your back and you're stressed, you're going to lose your erection. Adrenaline-induced erectile dysfunction. Okay, next slide. Uh, can you bring that up? This is uh, over the counter. It says, yeah. the first all-natural male enhancement program that adds one to three inches to your size in just eight months or get double your money back. Is that true? No. So listen, you're the world authority on sexual nutraceuticals. I don't know that you know this about Mark, but he really is the go-to guy for sexual nutraceuticals. Some very brief comments on sexual... you are going to say I was the go-to guy for sex. <laughs> uh, go ahead, sorry. Unfortunately not. So, so um, <laughs> here's the deal. There's a 30% placebo response rate. Most of these products are going to have some testosterone analogs, androstenedione or DHEA in them. You need to be careful if you've got prostate cancer. And some of them have Viagra Levita or Cialis in there. So if you're using these products because your doctor says you're using nitroglycerin and you shouldn't use Viagra, these put you at in danger. So there's no evidence, billion dollar industry, no evidence whatsoever that over-the-counter mail-order nutraceuticals are doing anything physically. Now, L-arginine, terrestrial tribulus, Venus sativa, ginkgo biloba, ginseng, yohimbine, all the things that appear in every male health product, no evidence that outside of a Petri dish, no evidence yet, maybe ginseng in the future, but no evidence yet that they do anything. Okay? With regard to your penis size, go to your room today, on your own, stand in front of the bathroom mirror, grab the head of your penis, pull it as hard as you can, that is what God gave you, and that is all you'll ever get. You can change the size of the flaccid penis, but never the erect penis. Period. Uh, fill in the blank here. I'm a, now I'm really worried. I just, no, no. I just gave you a visual, and I'm having trouble with it. Uh, no, but really fill in the blank here, because I want people to leave here with this thought, because I got this from you, and I just want to make sure that this is right. Every 10 to 15 pounds of weight loss can add an extra blank of exposed penis length. Every 10 to 15 pounds I, shortens your penis. If you lose weight though. Oh, I see what you're saying. If yeah. you, I, but I want, them to, I want people to hear this because you well, look I don't, for all these gimmicks. If you lose 10 to 15 pounds of weight, what does that mean for your penis? I don't know that there's actually one answer, but I mean, generally speaking, we talk about an inch, right? 10 to 15 pounds an inch. Here's what happens. You put weight on. Where's the first place you put weight on as a man? In your prepubic fat pad. That little pad that sits right on top of your penis, okay? An inch, two inches, now your penis looks shorter, okay? You measure the penis from the bone to the tip, and you put fat on, you're going to look like you've got a shorter penis, okay? So the first step in making your penis look longer is get on the treadmill this afternoon. It's true. That's actually true. And if Viagra was smart, they would, every prescription would come with the treadmill. <laughs> um, all right, one more slide. I want, to show you, I want to show you how cute you were as a baby. Look how cute you were. And then let's go to the next slide. Look at that split. Oh, you were beautiful. You were beautiful. All right, I, you know how much I love you. I'm glad you came here. But uh, uh, as Lorena Bobbitt once said, we've got to cut this short. So we've got to um, just get that one. Anyway, good seeing you. Thank okay. you very much. My pleasure. I'll see you all soon.
Thank you.